Good evening, everyone, and you're all very welcome to this evening's CPSMA webinar on data protection. Before I hand you over to your host, just a little bit of housekeeping from us. You are in Zoom webinar format, so therefore you cannot be seen and heard. And for the purpose of this evening's webinar, we won't have the Q&A or the chat enabled. There will be a recording of the webinar post event. We will be running a, a couple of polls throughout, so we look forward to interacting with you then. Without further ado, I'll hand you over to your host, Mr. Paul O'Donnell. Thank you very much, Leo. Uh, Good evening, everyone. I was Falcherova Leg Quig and Webinar Shaw, OCPSMA, Air and Tame Data Protection, with myself, Paul O'Donnell, and my colleague, Susan Carpenter. So this has been an extraordinary year in many ways for schools, but there are some certainties there and some signs for hope in the future. The swallow is back, the cherry blossom is out, schools are still open, and also school boards still require support in running their schools. So that's what we hope to do this evening with you in the area of data protection. And we're going to look at a few areas. Number one, where has the increased focus on data protection come from? Second of all, what are the principles that underpin data protection and how do they relate to your school? Third of all, then, is some practical, I suppose, questions and answers, thanks to all of the submissions we've had from you. And finally, then, how you as boards can implement and sustainably embed data protection in your schools. So, and we hope to do all that and promise to have you finished within the hour. And we're taking a sandwich approach. We have forwarded some terms for you in advance. And also then we're, we're hoping afterwards that we will have quite a few resources available for you to help you in this area afterwards. And we'll reference them throughout the webinar. The other thing as well, just to say is, as you say, you will get the, the PowerPoint slides, the recording, but it might be worth having a pen and paper handy or having a keypad uh, at the ready just to take some notes as we go along. And the final point here is for future viewing of this recording. It is being recorded on the 29th of April and it's based on current legislation and guidance, which may be superseded in the future. So we've had, we have a diverse group with us this evening and a huge attendance, which we're delighted with. And we have 20% who are chairs, 3% other patron nominees, 8% community nominees, 8% teacher nominees, 8% parent nominees, so very evenly spread among those three categories, and probably not surprisingly, 54% who are principals. And we're going to begin this evening with a poll, and the poll is in relation to data protection. Out of five, how would you rate your current level of data protection in a school context? So we'll give you a few seconds there to answer, uh, answer that one. And that'll give us a starting point for, I suppose, the level of understanding that we, we, you have. Because I assume we will have participants who maybe know very little practically about what is needed in the school, uh, up to those who maybe are dealing with this on a daily basis. So we'd expect a wide range, and um, but then I suppose, who am I to judge? So I think Leo is just going to give you a few more seconds. And here we go. So about half of you on, on say, a three out of five, which again, you can, you can basically see that, that kind of a curve from um, one up to three and back again to five. So we hope that wherever you are on that scale, that will move you up a point or two before the end of this, this evening. So our starting point here in terms of data protection, just in relation to your role is the governance manual, which is your Bible as such for the running of your board. And this would have been uh, in place for you when, you when you started in your role in 2019. And it sets out the role of the board and the formation and the running of, of the board in your school. And before you acted as a board member, you would have signed a declaration to say that you would adhere to the rules and regulations within it, and also other circulars, guidance, information notes from uh, in, in relation to education. 
And the requirement for boards with regard to data protection is in section 21 of this governance manual. And it is useful reading for you in relation, in conjunction with this webinar this evening. So next of all, why this increased, I suppose, interest in data protection. So data protection really means uh, respecting the rights of pr to privacy of individuals or what they're termed of in this regard, data subjects. And in 2016, the European General Data Protection Regulation came into place. And this then also took effect in Ireland in 2018 as the Data Protection Act. And really, it puts an increased responsibility on organizations like schools that host or hold data on behalf of individuals. And really what it means is that data subjects are in a stronger position with their rights with regard to them. And finally, you'll see a note there on the Freedom of Information Act. And schools, only uh, education and training board primary schools are comprehended by freedom of information. So um, Catholic primary schools are not as it currently stands. But a, a school that does give information or that passes information or data to a statutory body like the HSE, for example, that then could be uh, accessed as a freedom of information request. So next of all, as you can see from what I've just said, this raises quite a lot of questions for schools with regard to data collection. So loads of questions. What data should we have in our school? What can we ask for? What maybe can we not ask for? Who can access it? And if a third party wants the information or data, are they entitled to receive it? So in terms of, of the data that's held in schools, the majority of it pertains to primary school pupils for their education and their parents who act on their behalf. But schools also hold data person, on personnel, employees in the school for the purpose of employment, and also in relation to board of management records, perhaps CCTV if you have it in your school, and financial records as well. And GDPR compliance is, is the responsibility of everybody. Now, quite commonly, it's not just one nominated person. Usually the, what's known as the relevant person who quite frequently is the poor old principal, or else perhaps a board member or a staff member who are coronated with this title of data protection. It really is, uh, everyone has a part to play. And we're going to tease that out a little bit more. And I'm now going to pass you on to my colleague, Susan Carpenter, as we go through the seven principles that underpin this responsibility. Thank you very much, Paul, and hello, everyone. We're now going to have a brief exploration of the seven data protection principles. Data protection is really about embedding these principles into our day-to-day -day practice in school. So the first principle, as you'll see there on your screen, is lawfulness, fairness, and transparency. What does this mean? Put simply, data must be processed in line with the law. The data subject should know the types of data collected and the reason the school collects and stores the data. Questions that arise for us in our schools based on this are, what legal basis can we rely on to process this data? Are we processing it fairly and transparently? And have we communicated what, how, and why we're processing the data? Do we have a privacy statement? So let's move now to look at what legal basis we can rely on to process data as provided for in GDPR. So whenever data is being processed, all seven of the principles which we're going to explore must be obeyed. As well as this, at least one of the legal basis outlined in Article 6 and on the slide here must apply if the processing is to be lawful. Before processing data, we in schools must ask ourselves, what's my reason or my justification to process this data? So the first there is compliance with the legal obligation. An example of this in your school might be the processing of attendance records. The second is necessity in the public interest. That generally relates to a public body rather than to a school. The third, legitimate interests of the controllers. As an example of this is the use of CCTV, which we'll explore later in the presentation in more detail. The fourth is fulfillment of a contract. So an example of this would be processing data for the purposes of payroll for your ancillary staff members. The fifth is consent. 
An example would be sharing photographs to the school website, and we'll explore consent in more detail in a moment. The sixth is the vital interest of the data subject. So that may be to preserve life. An example could be sharing information regarding someone's medical needs with paramedics or an ambulance crew in order to preserve their life. It's important to remember as well and to be aware that additional protections exist for special category personal data. Special category personal data includes data relating to someone's ethnic or racial origin, their political opinion, religious or philosophical beliefs, trade union membership, genetic or biometric data processed for the purposes of identifying a natural person, data concerning someone's health, sex life or sexual orientation. In order to process special category personal data, schools must ensure that they have identified an appropriate legal basis under Article 9 of GDPR. This is something for you to be very cognizant of in your school. So if you're processing special category personal data and you want to talk to us about it, please feel free to contact us in the office if you need advice around this. There's a very helpful document if you're interested in legal bases available from the Data Protection Commissioner's website, and we also have a link to it on our website, which we'll share with you later. So as I've mentioned, we're going to move on to look at consent. Consent as a legal basis may be considered to be the weakest legal basis, as it may be withdrawn at any time. So if you're using it in your school, you should always ask yourself, is there another legal basis which we can rely on instead? And if there is, use that one. If no other legal basis exists and schools must use consent as their legal basis, they must be aware that it must be freely given, specific, informed, unambiguous, and come with a clear statement or affirmative action. This means that people must know exactly what they're consenting to. There should be evidence of consent and consent must be clearly opt in, not opt out. This may be a change in practice for some schools. Given that consent may be withdrawn at any time, schools should only rely on it as a legal basis if no other legal basis exists. If another legal basis applies, it would be prudent to rely on that rather than consent. Areas in a school context where explicit affirmative consent is required include, as we've already mentioned, the publication of photos or videos on school websites, social media or in the local press, or from a data sharing perspective, the sharing of children's names and details with a third party for participation in school related competitions or initiatives. So we're going to move back to Paul now to explore the next principle. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Susan. So our next one now is relates to one second. Hey, purpose limitation. So data should be specific that's being held. It should be specific and it should be held legitimately and only for as long as necessary. So in general, schools will only be collecting data on pupils relating to their education and employees for the purpose of employment. So can we share this with another group who re requested or person? And the answer here generally is no. However, it is yes in specific circumstances, which we will deal with in a little while. So next of all, data minimization. And schools, I suppose, historically collected data on a catch-all basis or just-in-case basis. And as a result of that, they had a lot of unnecessary data. But Data minimization, it, it runs contrary to what schools historically would have done. And if we take an example here of an enrollment application form, which has a section on it looking for that information relating to additional needs a child might have. So why are we asking for this data? Well, we're asking because it relates to a child's education. But then are we collecting it because we need it now or we need it in the future? And remember, this is just an application for enrollment. So unless it relates to a special class or a special school with specific criteria in this regard, this information does not form part of a condition of admission and is potentially or is discriminatory and it, it shouldn't be requested. However, if that pupil is offered and parents accept a place on their behalf, then once they are enrolled in the school, and then that information can be sought because it might be needed for, for example, additional supports for that child. So next of all then, here is principle four, and that is accuracy. And there is an obligation to make sure that the data is accurate. And also that if there are any errors in it, it should be amended also appropriately and quickly. 
So good practice here practically would be that the contact details that schools have for parents on file relating to their child, that that would be circulated or, or sent to parents on an annual basis to check that it is all correct. And that then um, it, that's the, the mechanism by which the data is being accurately held. And I'll now pass you back to Susan, who will go through the final three principles. Thanks, Paul. So our next principle, principle five, is storage limitation. And in essence, this principle means that data should not be retained for longer than necessary in relation to the purpose for which it's processed. You should only keep what you need for as long as you actually need it. Data should not be retained just in case it might be needed in the future. So this principle is really about good housekeeping. If you don't need it, you don't need to keep it. Storage limitation raises the number of practical questions for school. Do we really need to keep this data? And if so, why? And do we have a data retention policy? And has it been communicated? Most of the queries which we received in advance of this webinar related to the retention of documents, what to keep and how long to keep it for. So we realise that data or record retention is a big issue for schools. So instead of keeping you here all night by going through all of the queries relating to all of the documents individually, we've created and updated the record retention schedule as a resource for schools. It's now available to download from the data protection section of our website, cpsma.ie. This template is a blunt instrument to guide schools in considering their data retention practices. And in certain instances, you may be unsure about how long to keep something for, and we're happy to chat through it with you. So moving on to principle six, integrity and confidentiality. Schools are responsible for the security of any personal data collected and stored. Security measures should be taken to protect data against unauthorised or unlawful processing, accidental loss, destruction or damage. This includes training for all staff, as data breaches generally arise as a result of human error. Questions which we should consider in our schools include, what are we going to do to ensure that, that, that our data is secure? And that can go back to considering what we hold, where and how we hold it. And also, what should we do if we have a data breach, which Paul is going to address shortly. A query which we received in the office around integrity and confidentiality of data relates to the retention of confidential data by the chairperson of the board. As you may be aware, from time to time, the chair will be required to retain confidential board material. For example, the results of an interview process to appoint a new principal. And we would advise that provision should be made for the secure retention of this information in a separate location on the school premises, with an additional key holder nominated, perhaps the second patron's nominee, in the event that this information is required and the chairperson is unavailable. So that's something to consider in your own school. Moving on to principle seven, we're nearly there now with the principles. This one is accountability. And this principle does exactly what it says on the team. Schools and data processors are responsible for GDPR compliance, and they must be able to demonstrate that compliance. So questions we should ask ourselves in our schools. Are we conscious of data protection? Do we have appropriate records and processes which demonstrate our compliance? Do we have documents such as a data protection policy, a record retention schedule, processing agreements, impact assessments where necessary, sufficient training for our staff. The relevant procedures and documents that should be in place within your school will be outlined at this end, the end of this webinar, as well as links to templates and further information. So we've come at you with a lot of information there. We're going to take a brief break for another poll now, just to see, make sure we're all awake and still, still with it. So which of the following is not a data protection principle? And our options are number one, purpose limitation, number two, accuracy, three, data maximization, or four, accountability. And I won't see who's answered what, so it's okay if you get it wrong. That's great, they're popping in there now, thank you very much. So there's a lot there within those principles, but really it's to have an awareness to help embed them into your day-to-day -day work in schools. Because if we have that awareness, it, it drives us in our, our roles and responsibilities around data protection. So they're flying in there now. That's great. If you haven't um, voted yet, we'll just give you another couple of moments. Serious suspense here, Susan. Serious, Paul. 
Great. Nearly 80% say data maximization, which is not a principle, in spite of the fact that we might keep a lot of data in our schools. It may feel like it is, but it's not so well done. And thank you to everyone who took the time to um, vote there in that poll. So I'm going to hand you back to Paul now, um, who's going to go through some further information. Thanks very much. Thank you, Susan. So, one second. Next of all, so you can see there, based on what we've spoken about, the four most common areas in terms of schools and re in relation to data subject is number one, the right of access to subjects data. The second of all, that data subjects have the right to be informed of how their data is being processed. And this is met through a privacy statement by the school, a copy of which you will have in your access to in your resources afterwards. The right to rectify incorrect data, and we spoke about that, update and contact details, and also the right to erasure, including the withdrawal of consent, which Susan spoke about as a legal basis for processing. And while schools, apart from ETB schools, are not comprehended by the Freedom of Information uh, Acts or requests, schools still, or, or subjects, can still access their data whenever they want. And we're going to outline that process next. So that is known as a subject access request or a data access request. And this again has become quite common now for schools where parents on behalf of their, uh, of their children are uh, making requests to access data for uh, any number of reasons and they're entitled to do so. So they can do that orally but if, if done so, we would kind of advise that you would ask for it to be submitted in writing, either in an email or in a letter. Second of all, who can? Now, you may know most of the parents or guardians in your school, but if you're unsure of anybody or you're getting a request via an email, then you're entitled to ask for evidence to prove that that person is a parent or guardian and also to request some photographic evidence if required. Next of all then is what? And we would advise again that you try to refine what the request is going to be about. There's quite a difference between a data access request for perhaps a single yard incident report and every piece of data being held on a child. So it's, it's good to do that. In terms of the timeline, once you receive such a request, the school has a month to process it. Unless Now, that can be extended, but only if the school can demonstrate that the volume of requests is uh, very high or that this particular request or requests are un unfounded or excessive. In terms then of support, any dat piece of data that a subject is requesting, they are entitled to it. But if there are any other people on, stated on those documents, for example, a yard incident report, maybe a teacher is named, a pupil is named, an SNA is named. The data subject is not entitled to that data. So all references to those individuals has to be blackened or redacted out of the document. And for this reason, and for the reasons mentioned above, we would advise that you contact your insurer, school insurer for advice before, before a data access request is complied with. And again, we're also happy to help uh, where we can as well in this regard. And we do have an FAQ on data access requests in our resources, which will be available for you. Now, the next thing then is a data breach. And again, these have become quite common and there is now a comprehensive process to deal with them. So first of all, also to, to remind you that the loss of data is also a breach as opposed to it going into the wrong hands. And in a follow-up podcast, which we've put together for you, we have an interesting story about a data breach, and there's uh, certainly good learning in it. So with regard to the breach, first of all, you assess the facts. How was this data lost? When was it lost? And is it retrievable? Who would have accessed it? And also, what is the duration of, of, of the loss? Now, having gathered that information, the regulations state that a report of a breach of data should be made to the Data Protection Commissioner within 72 hours. 
That's the DPC, Data Protection Commissioner Office. Now, and that's where it, it poses a, a, a risk to the affected individuals. Now, the board might also need legal advice with regard to data breaches, which we, had, we would advise that you get. And uh, the breach can be reported on the Data Protection Commissioner's website. Now, where the breach, as I said, is likely to result in, in um, a risk to the rights of the data subjects, they should also be contacted by the board to inform them of what has happened and what is being done to remedy the situation. And again, the Data Protection Commissioner will be of assistance in that regard. And as with all matters it, with regard to breaches, contacting your school management body, your school insurer would also be a prudent move. And details again on data breaches is available on the Data Protection Commissioner website. And we have copies of that on our resources section. So I'll pass you back now to Susan. Thanks, Paul. We're moving on to the use of CCTV now, which must always be justifiable, necessary, proportionate and reasonable, as it involves the processing of personal data. So any system being used must operate in compliance with the Data Protection Acts. In a school context, this involves having regard to the rights of staff and pupils in relation to the processing of their personal data. So there are a large number of considerations and actions to be taken in advance of the installation of any CCTV system or camera. Firstly, Given the potential large scale processing, which is inherently involved with CCTV, a data protection impact assessment or DPIA must be carried out by the board of management to identify and mitigate the risks of such a project. And we have a template DPIA available on our website to assist you with that. A consultation process should be undertaken by the board of management with staff, pupils and parents as part of this DPIA. If the school is engaging the services of a third party company, such as perhaps a commercial security company, to operate or control the CCTV system, a written data processing agreement must be put in place with that company. A CCTV policy should be drafted in consultation with the school community before ratification by the Board of Management. The policy should be circulated to the school community and reviewed at regular intervals. The location of any CCTV cameras should be chosen with great care. The school must be in a position to justify each camera location choice. Cameras should not be erected in places where individuals would have a reasonable expectation of privacy. A notice informing people that CCTV is in operation should be displayed in a prominent position in areas where recordings are being made and also at the entrance to the school property. This sign should be clear and legible. The CCTV system should only be accessible by the principal or other school employees who need to have access to the data, such as perhaps the deputy in the principal's absence. An access log should be maintained by the school, stating who accessed the recordings or images, on what dates and times, and for what reason. The school must also ensure that it can provide data subjects with copies of their images captured by the CCTV system, should a data access request be made. We would advise that in such a scenario, the school contacts our office and also their insurer for advice. Schools should be aware that images captured on CCTV may have to be provided to Angarda Siakana as part of inquiries into criminal activity. And if you receive a request, please contact us in the office for some advice. The Data Protection Commissioner have excellent resources to assist schools, particularly in the area of CCTV with their document titled CCTV Guidance for Data Controllers. And we have a link to that available on our website. So moving on to some physical and digital security um, considerations. From a security perspective, it would be prudent to ask ourselves, what do we need to consider in our own schools? Doors, locks, keys and security alarms, they only work if they're used. It can be helpful to consider how data is handled in your school. Waste paper, for example, with personal data which isn't required, should be shredded immediately, not just scrunched up and popped into a bin. It can be helpful to have a shredder placed beside the photocopier as breaches can commonly arise when people are rushing and they place waste paper into the wrong box or bin. Actions to consider around digital security include positioning computer screens in offices and classrooms to ensure they're not accessed by others, turning off projectors when accessing personal data on classroom laptops, updating and changing our passwords regularly, using encryption and having a security focused mindset around laptops and devices as well as securely disposing of them when they reach end of life. Really, security is about looking at our day-to-day -day practices with fresh eyes. What security weaknesses can we identify and do we need to update any of our practices? So I'm going to welcome Paul back 
um, now in a moment. And we're going to take a break from the theory to explore some common situations that arise in our schools to see how data protection may apply to our daily practice. So you're back there, Paul, a question which we often receive in the office, Paul, I was chatting to someone about it today, and it also came in from some of our participants, a third party agency, for example, the Gardaí, Tusla or the HSE are seeking personal data about a pupil in our school, are they entitled to it? Yeah, I, I actually dealt with, I know we spoke about this, I dealt with one of these cases earlier today, and as we have discussed data subjects, they have greater control over the, that, their data, but those rights are not absolute. So some legislation is in place in the country for information to be provided to certain state agencies. For example, the Gardaí, the Child and Family Agency, TUSLA, the Revenue Commissioners, the Department of Social Protection, or a judge in a court of law on foot of a court order. So in answer to the question, they may be entitled to the data, but there are some steps that they have to take before the school can provide them with it. And the, what the first, what they should do is that the third party should be requested to write on official paper with the, the, the nature of the request, as in what they're looking for. And also they should state the legislative basis for the request. So once, once on receipt of that from the school, the school can contact their insurer, they can contact ourselves for support to ensure that everything is in order, and then the agency is entitled to the data. Now, but one thing on that is schools should be careful from about other groups who look for data relating to pupils or employees, and they might be maybe the parent association, the book rental committee, local organizations or businesses, they don't have those rights. So schools should be very careful about data subjects uh, rights in that regard. And uh, just, I suppose, one back to you now, Susan, is let's say a parent wants to have a copy of teacher's notes about their child. Are they entitled to that information? Yeah, so that's a question we often get as well in the office, Paul. And I suppose the short answer is yes, they can be. Teachers' notes are created as part of their working relationship with the pupil, so as such, they generally may constitute the personal data of pupils. If there's any disagreement around that or you have any concerns in relation to it, it would be very prudent to contact our office at an early stage, your school insurer and also the DPC for guidance. All staff members must be aware at all times that any data they create may be accessed by those to whom the data relates. So always, always imagine that the person you're writing about is sitting on your shoulder reading it as you write it. Best practice provides, as you've already mentioned, Paul, for notes to be clear, concise and factual with no expression of personal opinion. So if this situation arises in any of our listeners' schools, please feel free to contact us in the office for advice at an early stage regarding how to proceed. But also if you want to chat around the retention of some data, feel free to contact us as well. So one back to you now, Paul. What entitlement do recruitment applicants have to their interview notes or marks? And again, this has been a common query in the last few years. And so effectively, this is a data access request because the, the party who has taken part or the, the whatever the candidate is in the interview, they, they are, it forms part of their data if they're named on those documents. So what schools should do in that case is they, they should give, if it's the marks that are requested, a copy of the individual marking sheets from each of the three, let's say it, it were three people who were interviewing them at that, uh, at that interview. And they're only entitled to a copy of their own marks. They're not entitled to, to know what other candidates uh, achieved. And again, it's back to redaction or blackening out any reference to the principal or the independent assessor or the chairperson, not only their name, but also their role. So that third party should not be identifiable. And again, we'd, we'd ask schools if they're unsure about that to contact themselves, to contact their insurer as a data access requests. So I'm going to give you two and one now, Susan, and that is in relation to role books. So may we publicly display old role books as part of a celebration or commemoration? Or, and also somebody wants to access the old role book, what do we do? 
So two for the price of one there, Paul. For all ma for major school celebrations, perhaps a centenary, schools may often consider putting old roll books on display. So if this is something you're considering in your school, you must be aware of the potential risk for a data breach. Because the definition of personal data under the Data Protection Act 2018 clearly links it to a living individual. This means that personal data relates to a living individual. If any of the individuals whose data is included in the roll book or on the page you're planning to display are living, then to share the information without a legal basis would be a data breach. If you're asked for access to roll books, schools must identify a legal basis for the request. As we've already mentioned, an example might be the guardie seeking attendance records of a past pupil. So we'd ask for a letter outlining the data sought and the legislative basis for that request. Any information which could identify a third party must be redacted such as perhaps details relating to the other past pupils on the same page. As we've already mentioned, if you'd like to chat through a specific query in relation to role books, please contact us in the office for advice. So a hard one back to you now, Paul. Thanks for the two and one. Does our school need consent to share photos or images of pupils with local newspapers or on the school website? I think you're making this out to be something that's not, Susan, because <laughs> we've dealt with this already and absolutely the school needs to have consent to do this because we're back here to what is your legal basis and consent here is the only legal basis that the school can use and you must be aware that that consent can be withdrawn at any stage and i know in my own school we have lists in each of the classes where we know who does consent and who does not for those types of activities and those photographs to be taken now, the, just a related matter, the Data Protection Commissioner has very good advice regarding photographs being taken at events, school events or local events relating to the school on its website as well. And we have that link provided for participants also. So we're now in the home straight and there's nobody better on data protection than Susan to keep you all between the ditches. So I'm going to pass you back to Susan for our final few slides and I'm just going to pop our presentation back up again. Thanks, Paul. You're very kind. We're getting near the end now, everyone. Thanks for staying with us this far. The data protection section of our website, cpsma.ie, has been updated to include a variety of templates and resources, including many of those listed on this slide. And they can be accessed in the members document area of the website, and they should also be on our latest news tab now. So there, we'll just move on to the next slide there, get people out for their cup of tea before the soaps are finished. There are a number of websites which may be of interest to you from a data protection perspective, including obviously our own website, cpsma.ie, the Data Protection Commissioner's website, Data Protection Schools and GDPR for Schools. And both CPSMA and the Data Protection Commission also have very active Twitter pages which share interesting pieces of information if you like reading that sort of thing like I do. So to summarize our webinar this evening, if there are five things to take away, first one is to practice the principles, embed them into your daily practice in schools, ensure that you have a legal basis to process data and beware of consent, use another legal basis if you can. Ensure that you have paperwork to demonstrate compliance and reach out for help if you need any support or advice. Paul and I, as he, as he has already mentioned, have created a data protection podcast to explore more scenarios for you and for schools. It's available from our website, CPSMA, and also Spotify. If you've had any particular data protection situations in your school that you'd like to share with us, we'd be delighted to hear from you. We hope you feel more comfortable dealing with data protection in your schools after this webinar. And it's really important to remember, school boards of management are not required to be experts in this area but rather having a level of familiarity is enough to be aware of your responsibilities and to keep your practices on the right track. And hopefully we've helped to improve your familiarity with it this evening. So thank you most sincerely for joining us this evening. If you have any questions or queries on data protection or indeed any matter relating to school management, please contact us in CPSMA. Our advisors are always delighted to speak with schools. You will receive a feedback survey by email following this webinar and slides, recordings and resources will be forwarded to you by email in the coming days. If you'd like a little bit more data protection for your evening, our podcast, as I've already mentioned, is available for download now. So we're done and under the hour. I hope you, we were good, good help. And if we can be of any help at all, please contact us. Our details are on the slide. Gurmila Mahagwivgalair, Slán, Agus Banath.